I'm Charmaine Robson and thank you all for uh, coming to hear me today. I'm going to structure this lecture, to begin with I'm going to start with explaining to you why I think this part of Australian history is important and then I'm going to give you some background on Hansen's disease itself because that's very relevant to what I'm going to say and then some background on the disease in Australia and in particular in the northwest of Western Australia. It's a long way from here but you know very relevant to our to our shared history I think and then I'm going to talk about some particular features uh, distinctive features of life in the leprosarium for the staff and the patients and make a few points, the points that I think are important as I go along. I can't compress all of this history into this time but I've just drawn out the, the aspects that I think are important and I think that you might be interested in hearing. Hopefully uh, you, it might raise some questions for you and, and I'd love to have your questions at the end. So the Derby leprosarium is firstly very significant for the Indigenous people of the northwest of Western Australia. It was specifically established for Indigenous patients with Hansen's disease. Only about three white people ever were patients there and approximately 1,200 people were inmates of this institution in total over the 50 years it was in operation. This makes it the largest of all such institutions in this country in terms of numbers detained. Many Indigenous people spent decades in the leprosarium and 350 died there. They have a cemetery there, which you can see on the PowerPoint. Uh, the graves are mostly unmarked. They don't really know where the people are buried, but each person is represented by a simple white cross. And there's also a large wall, uh, which you can't see there, which has all the names engraved. So these large numbers of Indigenous people who died or were in that leprosarium have relatives in the Kimberley region and outside that area as well. A lot of Indigenous people are related to them or have, or have, have friends who were there. So the place and its history are very important to those people. And this newspaper article that was just uh, <coughs> published in June this year is testament to that. You have a lady here who was a patient there as well as a, another woman and they're trying to appeal to governments to provide some funding to preserve the remaining buildings on the site. And they need money to do that, so I hope they're successful because it's a very hostile environment as far as preserving the buildings. It, you know, it's very dry and dusty and there's a lot of insects and um, hopefully they won't just deteriorate to nothing. Finally, the Derby Leprosarium is an important part of history for the Sisters of St John of God. And this is a community of Catholic sisters whose members nursed and educated the patients over the whole 50 years of the operation of the leprosarium. They lived there, they were very much part of the history. And I say this with a qualification that there were differences in the positions they held and the experiences they held because the sisters had some choice to take this path in life. The patients were physically compelled to take it. Okay, so I want to now look at Hansen's disease itself. So it's a mildly infectious disease caused by a bacteria or a bacillus called Mycobacterium leprae. It mainly affects the skin and nerves. And importantly, it varies in form and severity. So you're probably aware with the sort of classical image of the sufferer of Hansen's disease as having, you know, quite extreme disfigurements and deformities and disabilities. Not everybody was affected in that way. They had, you know, a huge range of conditions. Some people remained mobile for all of their lives. Some people died quickly of it. Some people lasted for years. So it's very, very different. You can't really make any generalisations about it. We don't know how Hansen's disease is transmitted. They didn't know at the time of, you know, when the leprosarium was open, they still don't really know, but it's definitely person to person, and this was known, probably by droplet. Leprosy has a, or Hansen's disease has a long incubation period. It can be more than 10 years. And the significance of this is that somebody can have contracted the disease and be walking around for 10 years and infecting other people. So it does raise a question over the value of isolating somebody with this disease because, you know, who else has been infected? And this, this is a problem. There was no effective treatment until the late 1940s and this is when <coughs> the discovery of antimicrobials were introduced and this is also important because it determined, it, it started to change the way official and public responses were made to the disease. 
just looking at Hansen's disease, how, how you know its history in Australia generally. So it wasn't known in the Indigenous population until the late 19th century. It was first noticed, I suppose, in the 1850s in um, Victoria. By the mid 1920s, most cases notified to authorities were Indigenous, and they were located in the north part of Australia, Northern Territory, northwest of Western Australia, and Northern Queensland, and also some more southerly parts of Queensland. European people and Chinese people and other races did acquire the same disease, but by this time in the 1920s, it was very much um, the majority were Indigenous people. The response by colonial and later state authorities in Australia to this disease was to isolate people with Hansen's disease, either on small islands or on the coastal fringes in sort of desolate little areas well away from the mainstream of society. And we have an example here in New South Wales, the Little Bay Lazaret, as it was known at the Old Coast Hospital, or you might know it as Prince Henry's. Not really far from here now, but at the time, in the late 19th century when it was opened, it was considered well away from uh, Sydney. So these special places that were set apart for people were known as lazarets. And in part, the practice of isolating people on these distant, in these distant sites was following a convention that was undertaken in overseas, various uh, places, you might have heard of Molokai on, um, in Hawaii and various other so-called leper colonies. So Australia was following a tradition or a convention, but it also had, the disease had a really horrific reputation in Western culture and people were frightened of it. So it was considered, you know, better to put these people away out of sight. So isolation was a main policy and this applied to everybody regardless of their race. And in fact, from the late 1800s, most states and colonies passed laws to make it compulsory to report any cases of Hansen's disease if you came across them, whether you're a doctor or a member of the public. And these laws also gave states or health departments the legal right to remove these people from their homes and detain them in these places. So quite a harsh, you know, quite a harsh policy. Looking at the Kimberley area, in the early 1930s, there were increasing notifications of uh, Indigenous people with the disease in these areas, these coastal areas, Broome, Beagle Bay and Derby. Now the first, uh, well not the first, perhaps there, there were some small lazarets set aside earlier than this for the odd few cases, but once the larger numbers started coming through, the patients were sent to Channel Island, and this was a leprosarium off the coast of the Northern Territory near Darwin. It was a thousand kilometres uh, distance by boat from, say, Derby around up the coast to Darwin. The seas were rough. The patients were huddled in confined space, and it would not have been a pleasant journey at all. And remember, these people were sick. Not a, not a very good uh, outcome for them. The other thing is once they were removed to the Northern Territory, they were very unlikely to see their families again. At the same time, new cases kept coming up in the Kimberley. There were delays in shipping them and there were fewer and fewer spaces at Channel Island because the Northern Territory had its own increasing problem. So these new cases that mounted up were kept in two different makeshift lazarettes. One was at the Beagle Bay Catholic Mission and the other on the grounds of the Derby Hospital. Now, at the latter, the Sisters of St John of God carried out the nursing duties, and also the Bishop, Otto Reibel, arranged for two German tropical medicine specialists to come over and give medical care to these patients. So he had asked for help from the government and they said, no, you know, you can do that yourself if you want. So, so he organised that. Whereas at the Derby Lazaret, a nurse and her husband, Mr and Mrs Luya, looked after the patients. Both parties received uh, medication from the West Australian Government and they also received subsidies per patient. Unfortunately, Mrs Luya was a little bit overconfident with her abilities and because she wasn't given adequate supervision by the doctor who was overworked and not always around, she devised her own treatments and she also diagnose people herself. So that did become a problem um, when it was discovered that some people were detained in this lazarette and they didn't actually have Hansen's disease. So even more, more of a problem. In 1934, 
the Western Australian Government ordered a Royal Commission to investigate, report and advise upon matters in relation to the conditions and treatment of Aborigines. Henry Joyle Mosley was the appointed commissioner. And when he learned about Hansen's disease in the course of his general investigations, he was quite shocked and he declared it of the greatest importance of all other diseases. So keenly, he said, did I feel the urgency of this subject that on 3rd of July 1934, I submitted to Your Excellency from Derby an interim report. So he was concerned about the increasing numbers of cases coming to light in the West Kimberley, and he expressed concern at the lack of secure isolation at the Derby Lazarette. There was no fence or anything to stop people just wandering into town and mixing with the public. The public, you know, the townspeople were upset about this. And finally, he roundly condemned the policy of sending the patients to the Northern Territory. And he wrote, in spite of the utter discomfort and wretchedness obtaining under the present system, the only request I had from the patients was that they should not be sent to Darwin. So here's somebody in a senior position actually sympathising with these people. And, and that wasn't a common thing, I can tell you, from all the reading I've done. The policy he maintained was counterproductive to you know, having the disease eliminated because patients were so frightened of being found and sent to Darwin, they hide in the bush. They wouldn't you know, get any care at all, even the sort of simple you know, bandaging, the ulcers and so on. And in the meantime, the disease would spread. So mostly recommended a thorough inspection of the northwest region for Hansen's disease, abandonment of the Darwin solution, as he called it, and the erection of a state leprosarium, possibly on Sunday Island. And he said there the residents could reside in the huts, go fishing, and be locked in at night to prevent their escape. <laughs> <laughs> Mosley's recommendation took some time to be heeded. Uh, the problems he alluded did not go away, and by 1936, doctors began ringing alarm bells, and they expressed their panic in the newspapers, even you know as far away as Brisbane, the national newspapers and the local newspapers there were transmitting this sort of panic about uncontrolled Hansen's disease everywhere and concerned that people were eating food that had been cooked by Indigenous people with Hansen's disease. Now 147 new cases had been identified in between 1933 and 1936. It doesn't sound a huge number but it was enough to sort of raise these alarm bells. This actually prompted the West Australian Government to finally do something about building this leprosarium. But the West Australian Government didn't really want to pay for it and they appealed to the Commonwealth Government for a hefty contribution. And they argued on the basis that it wasn't really fair that they had a small white population and a large proportion of Australia's Indigenous population, and yet they had to foot the bill for this. And it was time that you know the Federal Government came forward and gave some money towards it. So the Prime Minister took it to Federal Cabinet and he got a £5,000 grant. And that turned out to be about a third of the cost of construction, the federal government refused to pay for the maintenance of the patients, even though they were asked. So by December 1936, the leprosarium was open for business, and the decision was taken to build it on the mainland rather than an island, so that the doctor could have access to the patients. And this was different from the other equivalent institutions elsewhere in Australia, where Indigenous people were concerned. They were both on islands. So the, the leprosarium was situated on mud flats about 10 kilometres from the town. This was considered a safe enough distance and it was described as the best and most up-to-date in the Commonwealth. The first members of staff were the Mr and Mrs Luya from the Derby Lazarette, but they only stayed a few months. And we don't know why, but there seemed to have been some friction. I have a letter from Dr Davis, the district medical officer, who complaining that patients were overdosed on medication and that there were these people who didn't even have Hansen's disease that he'd had to discharge. So whether that was the cause and he, he was you know, discontented with, with the Lewis, I don't know. In March 1937, arrangements were hastily made for the temporary appointment of two Catholic sisters to take up the nursing at the leprosarium. And they were sisters Gertrude and Bridget Green. They were biological sisters as well as religious sisters. At the same time, the government employed a married couple to oversee the maintenance and management of the leprosarium. They wouldn't be doing any of the nursing. And then a few months later in July, the arrangement with the sisters became permanent. And this staffing combination of, you know, Catholic religious sisters from the St John of God order and 
a married couple to do the maintenance and the supervision, that remained the pattern of staffing for the next 50 years until it closed. The first of these sisters to work at the Derby Leprosarium, sisters Gertrude and Bridget Green, were qualified nursing sisters. They belonged to a group, the Kimberley community of the Sisters of St John of God, and they'd been working uh, as missionaries in the Kimberley area for about three decades. So very experienced women. They were not young, they were, these two were in their 50s when they arrived at the Leprosarium. Sister Gertrude held qualifications in midwifery and mothercraft nursing, and she needed that, otherwise she would not have got this position. Another sibling, Sister Matthew, joined the staff shortly afterwards. So, as I said, they, they had experience, they were used to working in these hot, dusty, hostile conditions that, that you know, the Kimberley is known for. And they were familiar with some of the patients because they and their families had been at Beagle Bay Mission where the sisters had worked. And for these sisters, based there in the Western Kimberley and immersed in the lives of these patients and their relatives, the Leprosarium work preserved and extended local missionary endeavours and relationships that began, you know, right back when this little community began. Now, it should be emphasised that the sister services didn't come for free to the Western Australian Government. A lot of people think they're just, you know, volunteers and were paid nothing, but actually they were paid £390 per annum, plus food and lodgings, for the two original sisters, and this was a rate higher than many lay nursing sisters earned in Australia at the time. Of course, that wouldn't have been much either. Um, but, it, but it was important because it signified recognition by the government of these sisters' qualifications and the value of their work, and it ensured the state bureaucracy had some control over their performance, or that's what the government assumed, because the Under Secretary said, our position is safeguarded by the fact that the nurses are paid servants of this department. Now, the sisters didn't actually get the money in hand. It went to their community because obviously they'd taken vows of poverty, so they couldn't receive the money. By early 1937, there were 90 men, women and children in the Leprosarium, 16 of whom were from the Beagle Bay Mission, while others had come from various cattle stations in the area where they worked as stockhands, domestics and drovers. And then over the sort of ensuing years, people were brought in from other mission stations, schools, town camps. There were school children, there were babies. Some of the patients who went to Channel Island came back, including a young part Aboriginal girl called Teresa Portolano, who I'll speak about in a little while. And from the 1940s, the Eastern Kimberley became involved. So you had people from Turkey Creek, uh, Wyndham, and you can see how far away where Wyndham is and, and where Derby is, I don't have a figure, but, but I think you can see yourself. The, the, the distances are huge. It's nearly the whole step, the width of the whole state because the Northern Territory border is just there. So they come from a vast area and they're, very, they're from very different communities as well. So how were these people found and brought in? Well, sometimes the public identified them, the doctors notified authorities. Other times people were found in what were called leper patrols. Here's a photograph of a leper patrol coming in, just, just approaching the leprosarium. And if you have a look, there, there are black trackers at the front. And then the fifth man along is somebody who's been found in the bush with Hansen's disease. And these patrols went out, they sometimes did surprise raids on, on Aboriginal people's camps. So they were quite distressing because they knew that if they told the people, if they warned them, the people would run away. So. Their only way was to use force. They sometimes had to chain people up. A group of Indigenous people, if they felt that they were going to escape, they chained them up by the necks. And they had to walk long, long distances. Um, you can imagine they'd have sores from, from their Hansen's disease. I think the, the thing about the chains is that it, it was brought up in Parliament, in State Parliament. Somebody complained and, and the parliamentarians talked about it and they decided to keep going with the chains because they said it's the only way we can bring people in. And they were doing this until the late 40s. And in fact, the superintendent at the Leprosarium, I have a letter from him asking for a set of chains to keep, usually the men who, there were women too, who tried to abscond, to keep them from escaping from the, from the Leprosarium. Obviously for Indigenous people, there was no sense in being brought in. They, they knew that white people's medicine didn't work. There was no point in going. And it was very important for them to die in their own country. 
with their families if they were sick, you know. So it was really against everything they believed in and how they lived to bring them into this sort of central place away from everybody. The housing was originally small huts, each designed for two to four people, um, made of galvanised iron, so very hot. Uh, but it was decided these little huts were too cramped, so they replaced them with these long dormitory style buildings you can see in the background there. Cramped huts was considered conducive to the spread of the disease. They were separated according to gender, um, and this was considered essential because to prevent sexual contact and the birth of children mainly, as these children were seen as at high risk of contracting the disease. And it's not only in the housing that you see the gender segregation. If you see, I'll show you some more photos, you'll see that the girls are often together and the boys together and the men and women, you know, very rarely together uh, mixed. Now, segregation rules did not stop couples getting together and babies were born in the leprosarium. And of course that was expected and that's why Sister Gertrude had to have midwifery qualifications. But the sad thing about the babies and the mothers, when, when the babies were born, they were immediately taken from the mother and they were kept either at the hospital or with the sisters for the first few weeks or months because a lot of these babies were very frail because of the sickness of their, their mother. Um, and then they were fostered out if they survived, which, you know, many did. Uh, I have here a, a very rough plan that I found from the United Aborigines Mission because they wanted to build a church. They actually didn't end up having getting the permission, but they sketched a plan of what it was like in the 19, late 1940s. And so you can see how the patients are on the bottom side of the road and everyone else who's healthy, the sisters and superintendents, are up the top there. Where there were common buildings like the hospitals and the kitchens, they had doorknobs, two sets of doorknobs, so the patients would use one and the staff the other so that the disease wouldn't spread. And of course the sisters always wore a different outfit when they were uh, attending to the patients. The sisters were in charge of giving treatment to the patients and nursing them. They were originally given a list of duties which read attend to sores, treat other diseases, give injections twice weekly, take temperatures. But this was a vast underestimate of the, you know, the huge uh, scope of work they had to undertake. The injections referred to in that list at this time consisted of an agent obtained from India known as Shawmugra oil, and it was a thick, oily substance that had to be heated on a kerosene stove, on a flame over the stove, and then injected into the patient's limbs or their skin lesions the, around the edges. Now, it was a very painful procedure, I believe, and I think you can see from this poor girl's look on her face that she's not, not looking forward to that. It was of questionable use, although the top experts in Hansen's disease at this time, internationally and in Australia, did believe that it helped to some degree. It was all they had. Each month the sisters tested for the Hansen's bacillus. They extracted serum known as smears from uh, behind the patient's earlobes. They stained it and examined it under the microscope for the presence of bacteria. And the results were recorded and they watched these readings over a you know, period of months and years to trace the course of the disease in the patient. And this became particularly useful when they did have effective treatment and you could see the, the bacillus numbers reducing. The greater part of the sisters' days and sometimes nights were occupied with managing and trying to ameliorate the very serious conditions and um, complications induced by the disease itself and by the medication which had some severe side effects. Twice daily, the sisters spent hours attending to routine clinical procedures, giving out medication, washing and bandaging the patient's lesions, pairing ulcers, applying caustics. Then they would go into the dispensary and they'd mix solutions and compresses, a bit of pharmacy work there. They performed dental extractions, they would assist at amputations, and they also provided anti and postnatal care and delivered and looked after newborns. So that list was a little bit unrealistic. The leprosarium was planned to be self sufficient right from the beginning, and this would not have been possible without the cooperation of all the able bodied patients. They were all expected to work if they could. The women worked feeding poultry milking goats, washing and making clothes. Livestock were purchased and some of the men who worked on cattle stations slaughtered them and processed the meat. And there was a carpentry workshop and a, a forge, blacksmith's forge. So uh, the men were trained by the superintendent in manufacturing you know, all the items and you know, parts of the buildings and things for the institution. 
Now, Mr. Powell, the superintendent, explained that such works would be both beneficial for the leprosarium and to keep the men occupied. And these two considerations, keeping the patients occupied and keeping the leprosarium going, were very important and they underpinned nearly all the activities that uh, the staff encouraged the patients to do. Particularly if we consider the subsistence aspect. In some ways, the photographs you're looking at, dated in the late 1940s, mask the picture of the very difficult first eight or so years of this institution in terms of material well-being for the patients. Attempts at self-sufficiency failed miserably due to drought and the death of crops and animals. Supplies were inadequate due to unreliable ocean transport, especially coming up um, during World War II. I have a copy of a letter from Sister Gertrude to the Health Commissioner almost pleading for some vegetables for the patients and some fabric so she could make the clothes for them. And she was told it wasn't her business, that it was up to the superintendent to deal with these matters. Teresa Portolino, the girl I mentioned before, she, she remembers women patients knitting clothes from the wool of the dead goats and sewing outfits from flower bags in these years. So times were very tough. And this doesn't accurately represent that. However, it probably does to some extent represent how things improved after the war. And we should also be cautious about the happiness that you see on those faces. I mean, no doubt there were some good times. You know, patients do look back and say there were, but it doesn't tell us about, you know, that was hard work and they had pain and they had homesickness and it definitely, you know, was a traumatic ordeal being a patient in this place. To return to the point about efforts to keep the patients occupied, most of each day was accounted for. Every morning the patients had to line up for exercises. This was considered physically therapeutic and as well as good for mental discipline. And the patients then had clinic and the adults went to their jobs. If they were children, they went to school, usually just for a few hours per day. Teresa had been educated at a Catholic convent and she took it upon herself to teach the children. And she taught them, some of them didn't speak English, they didn't even write or, or read English, and she taught them. She also introduced some children to Christianity by teaching them about the Bible and how to say the rosary. So we can see here we've got this sort of influence of Western culture coming through. Because a lot of these children had come from more traditional backgrounds. In the late 1940s, a new sister arrived who was both a registered nurse and a trained musician. Her name was Sister Alphonsus Daly, and she replaced Sister Gertrude as the sister in charge. Sister Alphonsus began teaching the patients music and established a patient orchestra. She realised both adult and young patients could pick up playing instruments without the need to sight read, and she appealed to the public and the government for donations of musical instruments. The patients played classical music and folk songs, and in later years, jazz and the Beatles. When official visitors came to the leprosarium, she put on a concert, dressed the patients up, you know, the girls in little pretty dresses, the boys in cowboy suits or suits, and um, she'd uh, have their hair done. And it was really, you know, quite professional. For, for Sister Alphonsus, the orchestra was served a, a number of different therapeutic functions. It was a kind of panacea. She told the patients that playing instruments exercised their fingers and therefore helped to prevent claw hand, a common problem for Hansen's disease patients. Playing music was also aimed to keep the patients distracted from their problems. And patients looking back on this time agreed that this was the main reason they were encouraged to play. In their words, music was an escape from confinement. And another claimed it was to keep us occupied instead of thinking about our relations. Another said it lifted our spirits. In her memoirs, Sister Alphonse has called it the therapy of distraction, and it was an attempt to substitute negative thoughts and sometimes negative actions with activities that she believed would be satisfying. And I think it resonates strongly with um, modern therapeutics for anxiety disorders used by psychiatrists these days, such as cognitive behavioural therapy, which, and I quote a psychiatry journal, seeks to maximise engagements in activities providing a sense of pleasure and mastery. And the fact that Sister Alphonse has spent such a great deal of her time and energy, I think is evidence of the suffering of the patients and her awareness of that suffering and determination to try and alleviate it. Sister Alphonse was under no illusions about the limitations of her techniques. In her memoirs, she discusses ruefully the young male patient whose sadness could not be dispelled, no matter what methods she tried. 
and we can't assume she was successful with the patients necessarily, but we do know she tried and we do obtain an understanding of what is going on here, her, like her attempts to bring her individual approach uh, using her resources and talents. And this is a way she was using her own religious vocation. And I think it's also instructive because it shows us that we can't assume how missionaries are going to do their work. It's an individual thing and we have to keep that in mind, I think. Sister Alphonsus eventually passed the baton on to a younger sister, Sister Camille Poitavan, a conservatorium trained musician. And the orchestra continued on well into the 1960s until patients started to dwindle and they didn't have enough people to play all the instruments. In keeping patients occupied in activities such as work and music, not only, you know, these activities were desirable for all sorts of reasons, but it also prevented idleness and there was this great fear about the patients being idle. Authorities feared that the idle patient would become prone to gambling, drinking and sex, all of which were disapproved of. And this became another reason for keeping them involved in respectable activities. One sister looking back on her time at the Leprosarium remembered Sister Alphonsus used evening orchestra practice to keep the men away from the women. So apart from everything else, the orchestra was a form of discipline and a much more merciful one than some of the punishments doled out by the superintendent, which included head shaving of the men and incarcerating them in um, the Leprosarium lockup. And I will show you um, an image of that Leprosarium lockup, which was built in, a, in the early 90, I think 1951. To, uh, for, for any men who were you know, really disobedient or tried to abscond. There are many as interesting aspects to institutional life that time here does not permit me to explore. In fact, before I do explore just two more things, I'll bring you back to some of those images. That, yeah. So this is the daily exercises, and they're all lined up. I mean, we're very lucky to have these images from Stuart Gore, a photographer who was so intrigued with this place, he spent a lot of time there and took these photos. This was for physical and mental therapy, and it was again part of filling those days. And if we go to the next one, that's the school, that's the school class. And Teresa Portolano there, young woman teaching, teaching the girls in the front row, the boys in the back row. And the sisters did employ another sister as a school teacher full time afterwards. Sister Alphonsus Daly, who started the orchestra, and she was the sister in charge for many years there, and really no end to her energy and um, inventiveness. <laughs> and then that's the orchestra. And you can see they're not just young, they're, they're quite, you know, adults and a wide variety of instruments. I think that's just the string section there, but there were, um, there was a piano and there were wind instruments and uh, a variety, you know, a whole, whole orchestra. And she had choir as well. So I, I also wanted to emphasise the cultural exchange that flourished in the Leprosarium due to the diverse backgrounds of the patients. Now this was a place that brought together Indigenous groups that were in some cases were traditional enemies of one another. They either had fights or they weren't allowed to be in the same place at the same time. There were all sorts of rules that you know, the sisters had to become aware of as, as they you know, learned about them. However, a lot of people did come together from different areas and, and they, um, they mixed in and patients learnt different languages from each other. They learnt about each other's cultures and beliefs and they also, to some extent, learnt about Western culture from the sisters and the superintendent. Now, although Catholic missionaries were the predominant carers, the, the practice of other forms of Christianity was also permitted. Um, Protestant UAM and Catholic missionaries had rights to visit and they had their own groups of patients who they conducted church services for and gave pastoral care. And this picture, the reason I have it up here is because it shows that they did have certain forms of corroborees were permitted there. It was very different from the Catholic missions where they discouraged a lot of these other cultural practices. Okay, in the late 1940s, the new antibiotics were introduced at the Leprosarium um, and these were called the sulfone drugs and they were hailed as the first effective and only treatment for Hansen's disease. This made a radical difference to the patient's prognosis and health, especially in the early stages of the disease. So those who had had Hansen's disease for a long time, um, still some of their problems that they developed, their uh, disfigurements and so on, couldn't be um, alleviated by the medication. They needed surgery and some of them um, were able to have that. It by no means meant the end of the leprosarium. It closed in 1986. The medication came in in 1940 eight or nine. So 
you know, it was kept, kept going for another th over 30 years. And that was because discharged patients had to remain on the medication long term and they needed regular health checks. And there just was not the health facilities out there in remote Australia at the time. You just couldn't ensure the patients were going to keep taking their medication. And some of them did need surgery, they needed a lot of support. Um, we had a lot of disabled people as a result of this disease. So they were held in the leprosarium instead. And this meant this sort of policy went on much longer than it should have, and this, this ordeal that they had to face. Um, in fact, Western Australia was much slower than the Northern Territory to bring in medical and rehabilitative advances that were needed to support and heal Indigenous HD patients. So it was only 1986, as I said, when finally the incidence of the disease, you know, due to the, the good medication, started to really reduce and there were more services, there were district nurses, there were long-acting sulfone drugs, so you could have an injection that would last you for months. All sorts of advances came through and they were able to close the leprosarium. For the few old people remaining, though, they knew no other home after spending most of their lives there. And that was a sad day when they closed the leprosarium exactly 50 years after it opened. It was a wrench for the St John of God sisters who were there at the end. They'd shared very distinctive experiences, so different and very cut off from the rest of Australia. Uh, and for some former patients and staff, this created a strong bond. What scholar Catherine Massam has called a family of outsiders. And as the late sister Camille Poitavan said, we realised the terrible emotional trauma they went through. We had a tremendous bond. I think that's true for maybe not everybody, but certainly a significant number. Thank you. Let's leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.